my shop was going down the tubes, my marriage was going down the tubes, uh, my life was going down the tubes, and my mum and dad uh, were seriously ill. I was born in a, a place uh, known as the Liberties, a beautiful, magical place, I would call it. My mum, uh, Rosanna, was a well-known Dublin street flower seller. Uh, she actually was one of the first to sell in Grafton Street. Two years, I love you flowers. Dad, uh, before he went to the war, um, met my mum at a dance. And uh, she tells the story that uh, he followed her around all, all night. And he told the story that she followed him around all night. So consequently, neither of them agreed. Uh, but he had to go to war. He was in the Irish Army. He was going to see no action. And he was uh, really a, an adventurer. So he joined the British Army at 19. He, he, he'd just barely gone 19. And they shipped him out to the Isle of Wight, where he did six weeks training. And then after the six weeks training, he was dropped in Africa. Uh, and he was part of Montgomery's uh, Desert Rats, who fought Rommel in the desert. Before he went to war, he said, if you're still single when I come back, I'll marry you. So she wouldn't go out with anybody for that entire time. He was, he was away in the army for six years um, and he, she wouldn't even date anyone. And when he came back, she went up to the local pub, found him and she said, honour your commitment to me, I honoured mine to you. So, <laughs> so he said, right girl, let's get married. And they, they got married. <laughs> yeah, I was very young, but I do, I do have some uh, like fleeting memories. And uh, we had a huge amount of relatives all living in the same tenement. So down on the bottom floor was uh, my grandmother, my paternal grandmother, Ellen Beggs Gannon. Uh, who was a, a brilliant writer and uh, she used to write letters for people if their son was in court She would write a letter to the judge and invariably they would get off the house was always full of talented musicians and Actors and all sorts of theatrical people and my grandfather my dad's father uh, was a member of the theatre royal and uh, so he, uh, he, uh, he brought all of that tradition into the family as well. Uh, himself and uh, my uncle Paddy set up a theatrical company um, in the middle of the, the tenement where we lived on the ground floor. Uh, I, I went through a, a, you know, a kind of a rebellious teenager thing, you know, and uh, I, I made motorbikes out of bits and pieces, me and my friends. And uh, we were like Hell's Angels, you know, big gang of us. We all had motorbikes that we made and we were all wearing German helmets instead of, you know, motorbike helmets and we were just really wild. Absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt, still am to this day, even though I'm uh, separated years. My family are still very important to me and my ex-wife, Mary, is one of my best friends. Uh, we had to work at that, I'll, I'll be honest, you know, it wasn't easy. But uh, we are really good friends and on good terms, which is great. Well, I met uh, my then wife, Mary, at, in 1974 when ABBA won uh, the Eurovision Song Contest with Waterloo. And we got married in 1976, yes. We had, uh, my se we had our second daughter, Karen, who was born in the 80s, uh, 1981. And uh, I, was, I was working at dead-end jobs as a builder's labourer. I was quite fit and strong, so I was always getting jobs, but leaving them as well because I wasn't happy. I started working uh, for a friend of mine who had a, he had a supermarket and uh, he took me on uh, just stacking shelves and uh, I wasn't happy stacking shelves so I worked my way up and uh, eventually I ended up as the manager of Spar in Llandogan Village. Uh, around the beginning of 1998 uh, the shop I had uh, rented, uh, I had a retail outlet, it was very successful and uh, around about that time there was a recession as well. And uh, so the footfall in the street started to diminish and there was a spate of handbag snatchings uh, due, due to a, a drug problem in the area. So less and less people came into the street and a lot of businesses suffered and mine was one of them. So my dad and my mum got seriously ill around about the same time. So as I explained on a, an interview one time in Brendan O'Connor, I said it was like a, a bad country and western song, you know, and I mean that sincerely. Uh, my job was, my shop was going down the tubes, my marriage was going down the tubes, uh, my life was going down the tubes, and my mum and dad uh, were seriously ill. So really, really quickly, 
everything happened. My dad uh, died in March 1998, Patrick's Day. My mum died a year later. Uh, but when my dad died, uh, that really sent me into a cycle of uh, self-destruction. I just drank until there was no tomorrow. I had left the family home. And actually, when my dad's coffin was in the church in Rialto, I was in the grounds of the church because I couldn't leave the church. I just wanted to be close to him. He was a buddy of mine as well as my dad, so I, I couldn't leave. And so I stayed there, and a homeless man named Tommy, who I'd become very friendly with, uh, over the, the years, I'd given Tommy a few quid here and there, and uh, he was very fond of me. He shared stories with me. And he came across me and uh, another two lads, and they put their coats around me and kept me warm and kept me alive during that very cold night. And from then on, I was on the streets. It was very bizarre because um, I, my descent into homelessness was very rapid. Um, uh, as soon as I, uh, I, I surfed a couple of couches, friends' couches, and then you run out of couches, you run out of excuses, and I found myself in the, a homeless person literally overnight. And um, so I adapted into that with the same uh, dogged determination that I had to become the manager of a store. I just, if I was going to be homeless, I was going to be the best homeless person there ever was. You know, I'm just that competitive. And so I just took to the role and um, I just learned the ropes really quickly. Yeah, well, um, I had nothing to wear, um, only the clothes I had slept in. So the lads brought me to the cerebral palsy shop in Rialto. And uh, the lady there, they told her that my dad had died and she knew my family. And so she said, don't worry, we'll, we'll kick you out. So she got a white shirt for me, a black toy, black shoes. Uh, a Debs suit belonged to some young man with black satin down, striped down it. And uh, I was all dressed up to go to the funeral and, uh, and it was really difficult. But my, my friends, the homeless lads, all turned up sober and all turned up uh, with some black on them uh, of some description. My family and I were very estranged at that time because, as you can imagine, my sisters were appalled um, that I was uh, a homeless man and that I was there with homeless men. And uh, not that they minded the homeless men being there, but the fact that I was one of them and didn't sit with the family, I sat with my friends. Um, and that just appalled everybody, so nobody spoke to me. Um, and I don't blame them. I think I drank to forget and then pretty soon I couldn't remember what it was I was trying to forget. So I just stayed drunk to, uh, to numb the pain of reality and uh, I think that's what you do as a human being. You find some way of numbing the pain and just for me at that time, alcohol was the panacea for everything for me. God. That was experience all right, you know. It's pretty, it's pretty rough out there and I'm very lucky that my dad was a boxer in the army and he was a boxer before the army. So he put us into boxing clubs. Myself and my brother Greg uh, would have been pretty handy. Uh, so I wasn't afraid of anybody physically. Um, I'm not like the biggest guy in the world. I'm only five foot eight, uh, average height. But uh, my dad gave me a, a sound piece of advice. He said, don't start any fights, but finish them make sure you finished them. And so that stuck with me and so that's what I did. I didn't cause any trouble with anybody, but if they wanted trouble with me, I gave them a whole lot of trouble. The, the hardest thing of all and the, the most painful thing of all is not the streets, the cold, or any of the lack of food, lack of any, any comfort. It's the, the, the hardest pain of all is loneliness and I think you suffer from that uh, on the streets a hundred times worse than if you're lonely in a flat. If you're lonely in a flat you have somebody might call to you and they might knock the door to see how you are and uh, or you, you have a location to be lonely in but when you're on the streets nobody makes eye contact with you, nobody talks to you, nobody calls your name, nobody had called my name for three years. I didn't hear my name called. 
they called me Gigi on the street. That was my nickname, or Pancho. Uh, but that, that, the loneliness was the hardest of all, I think. Time, a little bit of time, say hello to me. I do that all the time now, I, I'll, I'll do both. Uh, my kids do say to me, you shouldn't go into town with money, Dad, because you come home with nothing. I, I once walked home because I, I'd given away, I had no bus fare, so I walked home. Um, but uh, I, I think that um, it's no good just giving a kind word, you have to throw them a few quid as well. And I give school talks uh, for Dublin Simon, I'm Dublin Simon ambassador, and so I give school talks. I've been to 60 schools, over 60 schools since the beginning of the year. And I tell them when they ask me, who are the homeless? And I say, there's somebody's son, somebody's daughter, somebody's brother, or somebody's father, or somebody's mother. That's who they are. And they deserve to be treated with respect and with dignity. And don't label everybody. I, I met, in rehab, I met compo a composer, I met a junior barrister, a junior doctor. I met uh, all sorts of different uh, you know, professions. And the one thing we all had in common was a broken spirit. And I think uh, Sister Concilio in Athoy does great work in mending broken spirits. You know, I'm a very spiritual person. I, I'm not religious. In it per se. I was born a Catholic, raised a Catholic. Um, I love the Catholic faith, but I don't love everything about it, and I don't love what has happened in the Catholic Church. But I'm still very, very uh, spiritual, because human beings uh, make these mistakes, not God. And so I stayed spiritual, and I firmly believe that if you have faith in yourself, and faith in something bigger than yourself, it doesn't matter what name you call your God, he could be Muhammad, he can be Buddha, he can be Jesus. Um, but as long as you recognize that there is a greater power above you who is a benevolent uh, force in your life, then that instills in you a sense of uh, belonging to somebody or something. And that fires and fuels your desire to gain uh, some ground in this world, some dignity back in this world. Because the first thing you lose when you go on the streets is your dignity. I was down around Christ Church, it was New Year's Eve, uh, I was told it was the eve of a new millennium, I didn't even know what a millennium was, I didn't even know it was New Year's. And uh, this young girl was going by about 8 o'clock, a very cold, wet night, and I was sitting on some steps on my own, and she walked by with her boyfriend and she was just down the hill from me a bit, but I saw them go by and she looked up and she stopped and she came back to me. And uh, she just knelt in front of me and said, hello, what's your name? And I was shocked, you know, that this human being was talking to me and I didn't know what to say. So she said, can you not remember? And I said, I can't for a minute, but give me a minute. And I said, it, it's Glenn. And she said, uh, okay, Glenn, what would make you happy? And I said, I'm okay. I said, oh, I'm happy. And she said, hang on a sec. And she went down to her boyfriend and she took some drink off and they were going to a party, I found out afterwards. And she came back and she gave me two cans and a, you know, a nag and a whiskey and some cigarettes. I said, well, I'm happy anyway, but now I'm even happier because you're talking to me. And she said, um, okay. And she chatted to me for about 10 minutes and uh, she said, what would make you really happy? And I said, well, my daughter had um, a baby uh, a few weeks ago. I can't remember, I said, it was a few months ago or a few weeks ago, but I heard that she had a baby. And uh, I said, I went along to see if I could see the little fella. And I'd love to go home and see him before I die. And I wasn't being dramatic. Uh, I had some serious illnesses back then. I uh, collapsed, I, uh, I was malnourished. I was seven stone. I had uh, bronchial pneumonia, emphysema, arteriosclerosis in my legs from smoking broken roll-ups and uh, lots of other conditions. I just was at that store, and uh, I said, I'd like to see the little fella before I die. And she said, well, why don't you go home? And I said, because I haven't got a home. And she said, yes, you have, go home. And she kissed me on the cheek, I couldn't believe it. I still to this day haven't found her. She's out there, she's going about her business and she doesn't know that she changed my life forever. That made me realize I have to do something and I have to do something positive and I have to do it now. I can't drink this drink and do it tomorrow. So I walked up to my friends on the corner and I gave them the bag of drink 
and I gave them some of the cigarettes, and I gave them what money I had, and I said, I'm going home. And they started laughing, thinking I was joking. And then when they realized I wasn't joking, they started crying. These are big, strong, tough guys. And uh, we all hugged each other, and I got on the bus, the 78A bus, and uh, I went down to the back of the bus and I felt like Moses with the long hair and the beard, like Jesus. And they parted like the Red Sea <laughs> and let me sit on the back seat. And uh, the bus man said he'd call me when he got to Clondalkin. And I knocked at the family door and my daughter opened the door and she just couldn't believe She didn't know me. She didn't know it was me. And she just stood there looking at me. And I said, hello, Karen. And she said, Dad, is that you in there? <laughs> no, I never forget the way she said it. Is that you in there? because I had all this hair and beard. And I said, yes. And she brought me in and then Mary was out at the time and Mary came back, and my ex-wife, and she said, look, you can have the back bedroom till you get on your feet. And if you fall off the wagon, you have to keep going because we have a baby in the house. And I said, absolutely. So that was it. That was my start. That was my climb back from there. I gave up the cigarettes, not because I wanted to give up the cigarettes. Uh, this has to do with acting, by the way. But I gave up the cigarettes, um, and my sisters begged me to give up the cigarettes because I had come back from the dead, as far as they were concerned, and the cigarettes were making me worse. And I was fighting against them all the time. I don't want to give up the cigarettes. They're all I have left. I don't drink now, so I have to have a cigarette. So I fought them, and they said, it's my dad's anniversary, it's his second anniversary, for Ash Wednesday, stay off the cigarettes for one day. So they bought me this new invention called Nicorette Inhaler. And I got the Nicorette Inhaler and I had my last cigarette uh, on the, the Shrove Tuesday. And on Ash Wednesday, I went on this inhaler thing, which is basically a big dummy for an adult. You know? It's like, you put it in your mouth, it's like a suitor, you know? You put it in your mouth. And so, it wasn't too bad the first day, the second day, and the third day. And so I said, maybe I can stay off them for a week. And so I did, I used that philosophy. And as my sister, my eldest sister, Maureen, she said, you couldn't even give up the cigarettes without being the best person in Ireland to give up the cigarettes. Because I won the Nicorette Award in 2001 for the most inspiring person to give up cigarettes. <laughs> and, and the part of that was a holiday um, abroad in a five-star hotel, so I asked my ex-wife Mary in an effort to try to repair the, the damage of the, the relationship, and we went away and realized that the fabric was, was gone. We, we loved each other as people, but we had grown apart years before the separation, and so we decided we'd, we'd just be friends and we'd try to build on that, and so that's what we did. But while I was away, I decided I need an education. I didn't have an education as a child. I had no qualifications whatsoever. So when I came back, I decided I was going to find uh, a center where I, an adult education course. And so I picked um, the Ashling Center because um, it was survivors of institutional abuse had set up this center through Christine Buckley, who I absolutely adored. Uh, I heard all these great things about her, and Christine was in Golden Bridge, like I was. So when I went into the centre, she said, she, we went into a room for two hours, and we talked and cried and talked and cried. And we came out of that room just emotionally drained. And uh, so she said, OK, you need to do a class. You look like an actor, you should, and I was fighting against it. I said, what's an actor look like? And she said, it looks like you, so go into drama class. And if you don't like it, you can leave. And no school inspector is going to report you to the authorities, so you don't have to worry. So we laughed about that, and I went in, not quite knowing what I was going to do. I felt a bit stupid, to be honest with you, you know? Um, but, because uh, I, I said, what do I need drama for? My life's a drama, you know? So she said, that's exactly where you need to do it, because you won't be acting, you'll just be being. And I think that's, that was easier for me to comprehend, that instead of acting, I was just being. So if it called to be a tough guy, and the first role they gave me was a tough uh, dub who was a drinker in a pub. Go figure, you know. <laughs> I was going to knock that out of the ballpark, wasn't I, you know? So uh, the, we did that as the showcase, and Eamon Farrell, Colin Farrell's brother, uh, and Jill Doyle, who's a beautiful friend of mine, two friends of mine, 
they came to see the performance and after the performance they said they came backstage and said look we really think you should join the National Performing Arts School we think you have a talent I said I'd like to discuss it with you but my sister had an accident today so I'll see us and I legged it out the building and I ran away on my opportunity to join the National Performing Arts School my sister had fallen off a chair that day putting up Christmas decorations and there was no way I was going to stand talking to anybody about anything I wanted to go and see Maureen uh, and uh, she gave her hell to me and said you should have stayed you could have got a break I said look if I'm gonna get a break I'll get a break and in the new year they sent for me to come to the National Performing Arts School and I told them I couldn't afford the course and they said we'll make it we'll make it happen if you say yeah we'll make it happen and they're that lovely they're they're just lovely people and they've been close friends of mine ever since so I did the three-year course and uh, I came out uh, we did a showcase in Trinity College I was playing the lead role I was cast in the lead role as this demented uh, guy, <laughs> Ricky Tomlinson, played the part in the West End of London. It was called Nasty Neighbours, and it's about this man who uh, becomes unhinged after he loses his job as a tr as a uh, alu glaze salesman. And so, what was you know what was to act in that? You know, becoming unhinged is easy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so yeah so I did that and uh, that led me on to other things and I got cast in a couple of different movies and so that kind of helped me you know. like I, I did a lot of theater um, and did never really thought about film I did uh, laws of attraction and I just got bitten by the bug I said this is the way to go this is what I want to do I got cast because I, I went out to my agent sent me out to be seen as they say, and uh, I was seen, and uh, they said, okay, we need, it was only really a glorified cameo role, you know, but it was a pretty important role because uh, the focus would be on you, it'd be close focus. Uh, so, um, so what happened was uh, the uh, casting director, uh, she, she wanted five people who would be on business class plane, flying with Pierce Brosnan and Julianne Moore from Ireland back to uh, New York, and uh, of course they had a mock-up playing in, uh, out in Ardmore Studios. I naively thought we were going on a plane to New York to film it. <laughs> I didn't bring a suitcase, I brought a toothbrush though. <laughs> so uh, so um, I think Mary Shriver was, uh, was, was the American casting director. And she came into a room and there was like lots of people in the room looking for these five roles. And I was playing cards because it was raining. And uh, so I had my tie loosened and I was playing cards and everybody else had sharpened up and stood up to attention But I was too busy playing cards with the guys I was playing with so I didn't bother and she came over and she just touched me on the shoulder She said and not you and I just said okay <laughs> Carried on playing cards so she was saying you and you and you and you and you and you and then she said and not you and not you and not you to five of us so the assistant director said Everybody who Mario Schreiber said you go to uh, soundstage B and get into hair and makeup and those who she said not you to follow me and she brought us straight through into soundstage A and up some steps and into a mock-up of a Boeing 747 and Pierce Brosnan and Juliana Moore was there and that was it we were in the movies so I said I can do this <laughs> I love this <laughs> And, uh, and I got well paid for it, so yeah, why not? So I, I did, I, I asked my agent, uh, Julian Baldwin, lovely guy, and I asked him uh, to put me forward for more film roles, which he did, and which I managed to, uh, to get a few movies, a um, few cameo roles. They're not, they weren't like spectacular, but I think the biggest one I, I really enjoyed was um, Becoming Jane, I uh, played Mr. Radcliffe, um, with Anne Hathaway playing Jane Austen and uh, James McAvoy playing Lord Lefroy and uh, a beautiful actress from England called Ellen McGrory playing my wife and uh, so we played uh, just four of us in a scene all day in the King's Inns over in Cable Street dressed in I was in a velvet suit with a white ruffled shirt and my hair was curled and uh, it was just surreal it was just absolutely amazing like that uh, here's this dub who had been living in laneways and I'm on a film set with some of the biggest superstars in the world. So I kept thinking I was dreaming and I was going to wake up and was going to be in a laneway again. 
Oh, she was just gorgeous. I mean, Anne Hathaway was... I, I didn't know what to expect, but she came on the set looking absolutely stunning in this massive gown. And she came straight over and she said, hello, darling. And I said, I love this woman. <laughs> and uh, she said, would you hold my hand? Because I keep tripping over the, there was, you know, wooden floorboards in the King's Inns um, and there were nails sticking up out of them. And she was afraid she tripped. She had these uh, kind of Louis heel shoes on her. So she held my hand almost all of the time, which I didn't get any extra pay for, but I loved it. And she hugged me every chance she got. She said, oh my God, you look so cold. I didn't want to tell her that I didn't feel cold. I lived in laneways. How could I be cold? <laughs> I was roasted. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, well, I pretended to be cold so that I'd get a hug from her, you know. <laughs> but she was lovely and she was very, very friendly. And uh, I spent a lovely just one day, but it was, it was gorgeous. Yeah. Uh, I, I believe that I was living the law of attraction before uh, I ever heard about it. I, I never heard of the book, but my sister said to me, there's this book out called The Law of Attraction, and I'd love to read it. And so I decided I'd buy a copy each for my two sisters. Uh, but <laughs> she'll tell you this herself if you're here later on. He couldn't just buy the book. He had to write to the website of Law of Attraction with a synopsis of his book and they had to go and publish it on their website and they actually did and it's still there. It's in reader stories on the website of The Secret and uh, I gave them the two books and I told them if you want to go read a good story, read it on their website and they couldn't believe it. It was our story was on that. Yeah, I did. Uh, it occupied my time. Uh, so I would uh, write what happened as if I was writing to Mary. So I'd write, Dear Mary, um, because I, I was really cut up with the fact that I, um, I couldn't make a success of my marriage. I mean, I absolutely adored Mary. I still love her uh, platonically, but I absolutely adored her all the, all the way. And uh, even when we broke up, I blamed myself. So I used to write these imaginary little notes. So I'd go into the bookies and they'd ignore me and I'd take a wad of notes and some burrows. And I'd sit in the doorway and I'd write a letter, Dear Mary, today uh, this happened, it was wonderful. This person said hello to me. And so I, I put them all into the lining. There was no pockets in the lining of the coat. So the coat was full of all these notes. But it must have been going into my memory because the coat was taken off me when I, I ended up in hospital. I collapsed in the street and they threw the coat out. <laughs> all my notes were in it. Um, so yeah, all my worldly possessions were in my notes. So I rooted the bins trying to find it, but I couldn't find it. Um, so yeah, um, I remembered a lot of it, luckily enough. I, I explained it this way once in an interview. Um, a caterpillar crawled into Coon Mirror and a butterfly flew out because I felt like I had come full circle in the life that I had been leading and I had not been serving my spirit and I had not been serving my creativity. I'd been ignoring them to earn money and the money was going across the bar into a barman's pocket and I was selling my, my gifts and so I decided that wouldn't happen anymore. If I could live on the streets with nothing then I could certainly get a, a little flat somewhere and do the jobs I want to do. And if I starve, I starve. But at least I'm doing what I want to do. And so that was my modus operandi and that's the way I, I, I saw it. Uh, so it was difficult to make that transition because when you've been isolated from uh, society uh, for any length of time, and in my case it was three and a half years, which isn't a lot compared to some people on the streets. My friend Tommy was 25 years on the streets. That's a long time, um, so um, a quarter of a century. So I, um, I felt that my 25 years was in those three and a half years. To me, it was like 25 years. And so I, I lost touch with humanity. Um, I had to learn how to inter just interact with human beings, just to talk again. Um, just to, uh, to learn how to eat with a knife and fork again, to learn how to mingle in polite society and not say the wrong thing. And, and, uh, and that, was, that was a challenge for me. And even to this day, and I put this in the book, I was at a, a party in Hollywood and um, a security man came through the room adjusting his earpiece. And he had obviously seen somebody doing something. And I froze 
because I thought he was coming over to get me and they were after discovering me and say, you have to leave, you, you shouldn't be here. <laughs> so it stays with you, it never, it never goes away. Yeah, yeah, everybody thinks I, I'm saying that I'm a miracle man, I'm not. Um, when I was on the streets, people used to say to me, uh, you'd be amazed at the amount of people that befriended me on the streets. I mean, everybody who went to church in St. John's Lane knew me uh, outside the door. I'd bless them, and I know that sounds a bit crazy, but I'd say, God bless you, man. God bless you, sir. And I'd never ask them for anything. And they'd come over and put money in my pocket. They'd stand talking to me and they'd say, I didn't see you last week, Glenn, where were you? And I'd been in hospital, sign myself out, and I'd say, oh, the weather was just so tiresome, I decided to fly to Bermuda for a week, and they'd laugh. And they'd go off happy and they'd give me a fiver and I'd, I'd be happy. And uh, so they, they'd say to me things like, don't worry, son, it'll, it'll pick up. You'll get on your fee. And I used to say, yeah, take a miracle, man. <laughs> You know, that was my phrase, it'll take a miracle man. So uh, I actually wrote a song called Miracle Man and I'll be singing it tonight for the first time ever. And uh, so uh, it's composed and written uh, with all of my friends who have passed away on the streets in mind and dedicated to them. So it'll be hopefully the team tune uh, to the film because I'm writing the screenplay as we speak. Yeah, the launch uh, has me kind of, I'm, I'm not a warrior, but I do be concerned about things. So I'm, I'm like, say if nobody turns up, you know, and I'm left in the room on my own. And there's only five people there and they're all my family. And then I just decided, well, then we'll have a good night and we'll enjoy it and that'll be it. And uh, it's no big deal. So it'll be what it is. Um, my book is available in uh, 42 Heaton stores nationwide and uh, it's also an iBook on uh, true um, iMusic. If you go on through iMusic you can go to the iBook store and it's $9.99 to download and $14.99 for the hard, hard copy. Um, and uh, it will be on Amazon and Kindle. I, I've thought about this because I've been asked by lots of people and lots of people have, you know, have, who, who have an interest in me and in the book and in the film. And uh, I, I really didn't decide uh, any, on anyone in particular until it was pointed out to me. Uh, now, this is not me who said this. It was uh, Frank, Frank Allen and a few of my other friends said that uh, Colin Farrell would be ideal to play the role because he's kind of struggled with his own demons. And the more I thought about it, the more it made sense uh, Colin would bring to this role a uh, great depth of character. He is one of the most underrated actors in Hollywood, in the world, uh, I'd say. Uh, when I'm teaching, uh, I, I sometimes teach uh, drama um, voluntarily, uh, and I always tell the students, uh, get phone booth, get phone booth out and look at it. And for 90 minutes you see one actor in a phone booth with all of the expressions, all of the emotions, all of the depth, all of the feelings, everything you need, all in one package. Go get phone booth and lear learn how to act. And so when, when I think of it, the more I think of it, I really would, uh, you know, be really happy if Colin Farrell would be interested in taking this role. So. Yeah, um, Liffey Side Productions uh, have approached me and asked me uh, to write the screenplay because they feel that it would, you know, it has all the ingredients for a, a major movie. And uh, so I'm currently working on that and have been. I've uh, been storyboarding it first. I'm an artist, so I draw out all the scenes in my head. I'm a writer, so I'm able to correspond the scenes to the dialogue. I'm a director, so I'm able to chop it and make sure that I'm not overdoing it and so um, so I, I've been working on that principle uh, to make it easier for and more streamlined to edit um, when the the process is finished and so then we'll be looking for um, you know some producers to come on board I, I have a few friends who are struggling financially I've got one friend who runs his own business and he was telling me this is the worst year ever for him. And uh, so we had a good long talk about it. And uh, 
I told him, you know, the best advice I can give you is to keep your spirits up. Keep your spirits up. Don't let your head dip. Keep your spirits up. Keep positive. In the face of hu huge negativity, uh, I mean, when Sam McGuinness will, will speak about it tonight, but when we climbed Kilimanjaro in 2006, I, I had, you know, some really serious illnesses before we went to do that. And uh, I wouldn't give up. And the doctor came to us when we were a thousand meters from the summit and it was minus 28 degrees. There was a blizzard. Uh, the two water bags I had on my back, which was four liters of water, just became a huge popsicle that I couldn't get rid of because it was under all my clothes. And he, the doctor said to me, just go back. Nobody will care. Like they, nobody will say anything. And I said, I came to climb this mountain. I'm climbing this fucking mountain. <laughs> Pardon the French. And so uh, Sam went back at Gilman's Point, which is a thousand meters. Now a thousand meters, when your your nose is almost to the to the the side of the mountain, it's jagged. It's frozen icicles. And uh, I wouldn't give up. And so I think if you don't give up, keep your spirits up. Don't give up. Doesn't matter if ten people tell you you can't do it. Be the one voice that say yes, I can. And if you keep that mentality, you'll get through anything. Creativity is a gift, a spiritual gift. And I believe that you're given it for a reason. And if you don't fulfill that reason, you'll always feel empty, always. Nothing will fill it. Alcohol won't fill it. Drugs won't fill it. Uh, lovers won't fill it. You can fill up on all of them and you still won't be fulfilled. So I believe that you are given the gift. You should use the gift, should use it wisely, and you should use it to try to benefit others. And if it can benefit others and tick all those boxes, then it's, it's on a winner.